Well, the victorious new you is the title of the message today, but I use that with a bit of hesitancy. Let's just start with the fact that being a Christian doesn't mean that a victorious life is a life of certain prosperity or a life where all your pain and scars just vanish into thin air or a life without any doubts. Now, we're in the season of Lent on the journey to Holy Week, and and from Holy Week, we go through Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and as I said earlier, over the years, I've mentioned it hundreds of times, you can't get to Easter if you don't go through Good Friday. Death to life, sorrow to joy. Truth is, these are not always easy transitions. And yes, in fact, I think it's often difficult to grasp what this even means. And perhaps it's even more challenging to truly celebrate it in our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I totally believe the tomb is empty and that Christ is risen. Both my heart and my mind believe that death has been defeated, that my sins and your sins are forgiven. And at the end of the day, love is victorious. Love wins. And in the words of Martin Luther, I believe this is most certainly true. And yet, as I contemplate the words of John 20 and Thomas's doubts, I resonate with his uncertainty. On this past Wednesday alone, there was another school shooting in Denver. The war continues to rage in Ukraine. More civilians, including children, were killed by senseless and endless bombings. People we love are struggling. And I continue to bury people that I care about and have known and loved for years. We have people still fighting to recover physically, psychologically, and or financially as a result of the COVID pandemic. And so how do we understand this victorious life when so much of life is in the shadows? It's painful and leaving us with scars on our hearts and our minds. How does this sacrificial love of God make a difference in our daily life? And is it possible for this to be actually more than just a bunch of theological jargon? My questions here are not new. They've been around since that very first Easter 2,000 years ago. So what is all this what does all this talk about joy and resurrection and Easter and victory actually have to do with me and you? Now growing up and going to Sunday school, I remember hearing stories about people in the Bible. And they were often people that were referred to as heroes of the faith. It came across somehow that they were one step up from the rest of us, more holy than the rest of us. But as I've grown older, I've discovered that many of these people were just as flawed or even more so than I am. And there's one guy in the Bible that I've always been drawn to and yet never heard him referred to as a hero of the faith. And it was the disciple from our Bible passage today, Thomas. Not called a hero, but almost always referred to as doubting Thomas. He's so incredibly refreshing in this age where people are demanding certainty. He may not be certain, but he is honest. And it's here that we pick up the story. In this account, we find Thomas touching the wounded and scarred hands of the risen Jesus. Some of the disciples had already seen Jesus. Others had heard about his resurrection. And here, Thomas has been filled with doubts and questions about his faith, about his life. And it's in this space that we often find ourselves. I find myself coming alongside honest and doubting Thomas. Some think it's heresy to be honest about our innermost feelings as we look at our lives and our world, and we think to ourselves, or even be so bold as to say out loud, I need to see it in order to believe it. One Sunday, right after 9-11, I expressed my doubts as to where God was in the tragedy, an honest question that I wrestled with publicly with all of you. It was not only my question, it seemed to be somewhat universal question. I had a member share with me after a church service how they didn't like it when I was so honest about my doubts, saying, if I had these doubts, how could the rest of us ever overcome our doubts? They told me that in times like this, I should preach happy things so they could take their minds off their struggles. The truth is, the good news of God, the joyful message, is God shows up in the 9-11 moments of our world and our lives 
so that as we journey through the challenges and the clouds of struggle and doubt and sadness that often obstruct our view that we have of God, we can always know that God is present. And we're on a journey together. And I know one thing for certain, and that life, that is that life is filled with situations and challenges that will shake our faith, but it will not and cannot shake the unshakable love of God for each of us. In this verse today, we're encouraged to feel wary, skeptical, and maybe even a bit envious. I'm actually a bit jealous of those who find faith easier to sustain than I do. I remember a woman from my church in Scottsdale, Arizona, 38 years ago. Her name was Candy. And Candy's life was far from easy. She had a husband who was on disability and could no longer work. She had a son who was born deaf. Another son had just gotten dishonorably discharged from the army. A teenage daughter with cancer and a little baby who was born just at the same time our son Ty was born. He had multiple health issues at birth, including a skull that was not fully formed in the front. And, and Candy was limited to, had limited mobile, mobility and spent most of her time in a wheelchair. And one day I went over to visit Candy after the birth of her son, and she was so filled with joy and faith. And I asked her, did she ever get angry about all this? Was she ever frustrated with God? And she looked at me like that never occurred to me. And then she responded, I only can thank God for God's faithfulness because how could I ever carry on or get through this on my own? I think of Jesus' words to Thomas in this passage today. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I am a, a bit jealous of those who've had encounters with the risen Christ that are more dramatic than anything I've experienced. I'm envious of those who, like my friend Candy, don't have a deep conflict, rational conflict, between the reality of the risen Jesus and the ever-present reality of struggle and death and darkness. This encounter that Jesus has with Thomas is so rich with God's compassion. Here is the skeptical follower of Jesus, after a really tough week, the pain of seeing Jesus arrested, tried and executed. Not only had Jesus died on the cross, but all of, of their hopes and dreams that they'd, they had based on Jesus, they seem to have died too. But Jesus doesn't chastise Thomas for his doubts. No, he shows up to Thomas in a body that still carries the scars and wounds of all that he's just gone through. A body that openly exposes the trauma of his life's tragic events. A body that will not hide its suffering, its sorrow, or its brokenness. These wounds are so fresh and raw that Thomas can actually put his finger inside the place where Jesus' body was pierced with nails and sword. We don't know, but maybe Jesus even winced in pain when Thomas touches him. If Jesus did wince or cringe with pain, it's just one more way that we see Jesus showing us how his life was so real. It is exhibited in a way that we can all identify with us. With, for us to actually engage in real life, in all its joys and all its struggles, means that sometimes we live with those realities of suffering and joy coexisting. For Jesus, there's the joy of resurrection, but there's also the reality of scars and wounds that are still visible. It is a sign of fully being engaged in life in this world. It is his real presence with those he loves. It is his presence amidst actual pain. And in this moment, his presence are his own living words to Thomas, to me and to you, the words that every one of us longs to hear in our hearts and minds. Jesus' real presence is saying to us, I am with you. I am, I am with you where and when it hurts. In my resurrection, it's tangible. I don't exist now in some sanitized reality floating above the clouds. I still have the wounds and the scars just as you do. And I'm dwelling right where you are. 
Sometimes as Christians, we're too focused on victories that, that look at the tasks that are complete, the races that are won, the enemy that's defeated, and the war that is won. Stories of failure seem okay as long as we can look back and see at the end that everything turned out okay. And sometimes we treat our faith more like a fairy tale. Wayward struggles in life that have ultimately, ultimately yielded to some new found holiness. What happens when our sin just continues to hang on to our heart and mind? What about that sin that just clings to us? Obstacles and trials in our life that just don't go away. Or wounds, be it physical, psychological, emotional, relational, that linger. What about the shame that we wrestle with? We look away and we find it hard to believe that with our wounds and scars still fresh that we could actually know what victory looks like. And herein lies the beauty and the strength of this encounter with Thomas. Jesus' very own wounds and scars bear witness to the reality that some hurts, some wounds and scars will always be with us in this life. They are, whether we like it or not, here for keeps. I can think of some tragic losses, some pains so deep and some horrors that people have gone through that leave scars that no amount of faith will wipe away. And we cannot pretend that the victory of the resurrection wipes away all wounds and scars and that everything is just honky-dory. It is okay to celebrate Easter. Easter that is just around the corner and, and the love of the risen Jesus while simultaneously grieving our shattering hurts and losses at the same time. It's okay to hear other people's uplifting faith stories and say, I'm happy for you, but my heart, my heart is still broken. It's okay to ache for some more of Jesus and to hold our ache and tension with the joys of Easter. Even as we are in this time of Lent, on this journey towards the cross once again, we continue to be resurrection people. We're reminded that even as these resurrection people, we can still cherish the wounds of Jesus. It is true, and it's okay as resurrection people, that we have seasons in our life where we're hurting or suffering. We're two weeks away from Easter, and the world will continue to be wounded. As we journey towards Easter, maybe the thought of a joyous Easter is challenging. But be assured that Jesus never hides or loses the inscriptions of his pain that are written on his hands, his feet, and his sides. Not even rising from the dead took away the scars. In many ways, this points to the magnificent fact that we have a faith that is filled with paradoxes. As followers of Jesus... We live by dying. We receive by giving. We rule by serving. Well, let's not waste time trying to alleviate the apparent contradictions of these opposing realities. But let's focus on living them out in all their complexities. Realizing this is what the victorious life actually looks like. Jesus' resurrected body, his victorious body, still with wounds and scars. I cherish Thomas's faith journey. As I mentioned earlier, he actually seems to get some pretty bad press over the years. He's very hesitant to believe what some of his buddies have told him about Jesus being risen from the dead. And can you blame him? How many people do you know that have died and you went to their funeral and then a few days later they show up for dinner? Thomas insisting on tangible proof is not an unrealistic request. People have treated this as Thomas having a weak faith or being stubborn. I don't think so. I think it's just normal human behavior. What I love about Thomas is his honest skepticism and the courage to question out loud. His conversion to believing takes more than just his heart's desire for Jesus being risen. He wants physical evidence that this has actually happened. Perhaps growing up with this story my whole life, I've forgotten how difficult the deepest events and meanings surrounding Easter and the resurrection actually are to believe, to understand and internalize so that it makes a difference in who we are and how we live and how we love. I think this is especially challenging when our own lives are marked with wounds and scars, pains and losses, uncertainties, and even death. 
And even as a follower of Jesus, I still struggle with what it means and how it plays out in my life, in my wounds, in my scars. I'm not the first to struggle with, and I certainly won't be the last. And one of the great points of this account of Thomas is that it reminds us that struggle is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Thomas is a person who is not willing to settle for someone else's relationship or encounter with Jesus. He wants his own. He wants something that's real, authentic, and transparent. He wants an encounter with a living God. Thomas didn't run away because of his doubts. No, he honestly confronts his own uncertainty in the presence of his friends, who seem to be far more certain. What I love about this is he does this without shame. The beauty of Thomas is that he comes to recognize Jesus, not because of the glory of the resurrection, but actually through his wounds. Imagine what the church could look like if we welcomed and embraced the Thomases of this world more fully. I pray we can embrace those who doubt with the same kind of generosity and compassion as Jesus and the other disciples did. They seem to allow space for the questions and skepticism. He doesn't get criticized for his questions. At the same time, the disciples who've already embraced the resurrected Jesus openly, though they, 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 they embrace Thomas openly, though they freely reflect on their own personal journey with the risen Jesus, they're not trying to force Thomas into believing their stories. They give him time and space to encounter Jesus on his own. Here's the great thing about Jesus in this story is that Jesus shows up and meets Thomas right where he is, giving Thomas what he needs to believe, Jesus' own fresh, visible wounds and scars, wounds and doubts, wounds and doubts. For many of us, if not most of us, this is the life of faith, a life where the intersection of Jesus' wounds and our doubts create the fertile ground for faith to bloom. And resurrection happens all over again. Jesus does not dismiss the questions of Thomas, nor does Jesus dismiss the questions that we have. He honors our heart's desire to know more fully, to see more clearly, to understand more deeply, and to encounter more deeply the power of his love and life. The love and life that Jesus brings. Jesus does not give up on those who struggle to believe. Jesus is always on the journey with us, even when we don't realize it. So like Thomas, may we come to know the great hope, comfort, courage, and love through the wounded and the risen Christ. Amen.